this morning we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, and then uh, Miss Maria is going to come up and share a song with us. And then we're going to get into God's Word. It's her birthday today. It's her birthday today? Oh, 29. The real 29. The real 29. I can't remember what that is like. The real 29. I'm only 30, but. Uh, all right, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for uh, this day that you've made, this day that you've given us to uh, gather and to worship you and, and to uh, sing your praises. Um, Lord, as usual, we pray that your spirit would fill this place, that you would fill our hearts, that we would be renewed in our affections for you, that... Uh, Oh, Lord, that you just have your way with us. Um, so many things in the world, so many distractions. And, and Lord, we just need to, to learn to rest in you. And so I pray that today that would be something that happens for us, that we would, uh, we would leave here trusting in you just a little bit more than we were when we came in. Uh, we love you. We praise you. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name. Marina, the birthday Even 
and Dwight said to me, he says, well, the bears were beating, right? That, that Paul, when he's talking about this here, why does he spend so much time talking about the resurrection? We talked last week about how important that is for our faith, that it's, that it really is the hinge pin of the gospel itself. That without a, a good understanding of the resurrection, that, that really everything about Christianity, everything about our faith, it just, it comes undone. It falls apart. It's what Paul says we're to be pitied above all others. And so, if I, if I sound a little repetitive this week, forgive me, but uh, we'll try to, we'll try to uh, keep things a little fresh, but really Paul is just continuing this argument about the resurrection. These folks, the Corinthians, as we've seen, have just, they just continue to get their, to, to get their eyes off the prize. They're not fixed on Jesus. They're not fixed on what's important. They're worried about gifts. They're worried about position. They're worried about prominence in their community. They're worried about all kinds of things. And remember when we started this series, I said, we talked about a lot of those things. And I said, it doesn't sound very different than the world we live in. You know, sometimes when we think of the resurrection, you think, well, and I've had, I've had people make this argument to me. Look, that was you know, back in the first century, and ancient people were superstitious, and they were they, they had different ideas, and so this wouldn't have been that hard for them to believe. But you know what? They're actually wrong. They're not very good students of history. You see, that's not how the Greeks thought. That's not how the Jews thought. Although the Jews, everybody thinks, well, they must have had some sort of understanding of the resurrection, right? Well, they did, in a sense, but not not in its full sense, not a resurrection of, of us, right? They believed in a resurrection, but it wasn't, it wasn't developed like you would think. So their worldview would have even been, well, let's just take, for instance, when Jesus was resurrected, I mean, how many people bought into that? Not a whole bunch, right? So all the Jews that he had been wandering amongst and, and ministering to were like, yeah, whatever. That didn't happen. I mean, he showed himself to, you know, it says 500 people, but they still didn't believe in the resurrection. And, and I shared last week that I think the church sometimes, I don't mean our church, I just mean the church as a whole, forgets the centrality of what this means for us. You see, we're worried about other things, and it's interesting because we're worried about things like the Corinthians were worried about. We're worried about the order of service. We're worried about um, was the music good? We're worried about, you know, do I like that guy's style when he preaches? We're worried about all of these different things, and we're never talking about Christ. Risen. Victory. We're never, we're never focusing on who he's called us to be. Instead, we live in a place that's extremely fleshly and carnal. And then we wonder to ourselves, why aren't people just flocking to Jesus? I mean, we put on a pretty good show. Right? We have all these cool programs, we do all this good stuff, and, and why aren't they flocking to Jesus? Well, the truth is we're not pointing them to Jesus. Right? We're pointing them to other things. It's no different than starting a business. When you start a business, you, you make a plan and you and you do this, this, and this, and you market things. And listen, I, I not too long ago was caught up in this. And it's very, it's very hard not to get. Is, does the website look right? Does this look right? Is this okay? Is that okay? All the, all the time losing sight of the power of the gospel. Now, I don't mean that it's not right to be winsome, winsome and attractive to the world. We want to draw them to Jesus. But if, if, if as we draw them and we, and we bring them around us, if they're not being pointed to Jesus, 
Why would we be surprised when we don't see lives transformed? Why would we be surprised when, when the church as a whole lives much like the world lives? Why would we be surprised? And I would argue it's because it's because we've lost the centrality and the power of the gospel, the hinge of the gospel. So let's pick up where we left off, verse 12. Paul says, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. But he says it right there. And last week we talked a little bit about this. What does he mean? You know, when we, when we say we believe in the resurrection, do we just believe in some truth that we were taught in Sunday school and that we were told this is what happened? Or do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? I mean, does it, does it excite you? Last week I did something where I was like, ah! Because I, I, I don't know why, and I, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm pointing at my knees. Why am I not more excited about the gospel? Why does it not excite me? Why does it not stir up my affections and my passions and make me want to just go out and proclaim it? Why? Because most of us in this room would say we believe in the resurrection, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just part of our faith. And so we say, yes, we believe in that. But does it stir up in us an excitement and a passion for Christ and for the gospel? Do we understand the power of it? Because Paul says without it, the best preaching, the, be the best music, the best programs are all in vain. They mean nothing. Last week I quoted um, Timothy Keller. I don't want to give him credit because I don't know if I gave him credit last week. But sometimes you're, when you're studying for a text, somebody just said something better than you're ever going to say it, so you just quote it. Right? <laughs> you just quote him and you give them credit for it because you're not going to say it any better. And, and what he said, and it, it just really sticks with me, is that, is, is that if the resurrection is true, nothing else matters. And if the resur resurrection isn't true, nothing else matters. Right? It's, it's just that simple. Paul goes on, he says, we are even found to be this is dangerous. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, and if it is true, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are, we are all people to be pitied. Another danger I see in the church is we, we don't think eternally. We want Jesus to fix our everyday life. This is what Paul's talking about. If, if, if Christ is only hope for us in this life, then we're to be pitied amongst everybody. Now, does that mean that our lives are not transformed by the power of the gospel? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that as followers of Christ, we're supposed to think differently beyond this world. That it's not just about my comforts and my, my position and all the things that I want to work out for me. Okay, just, just a raise of hands. Who had everything go right for them this week? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Really? <laughs> so did Jesus fail us? No. Right? Because deep down inside we understand that, right? Is it? 
little saying I, I, I try to remind myself that, that following Christ is, is, means I've been called to be a suffering soldier. We don't like that kind of language. You mean Jesus called me to suffer? Yeah, I get it. Get that in your head because he didn't, he didn't call you to comfort in this world. To be comforted by the things of this world. To be comforted by him, yes, but not by the things of this world. To be comforted by his power and his, his spirit. Verse 20, he goes on, he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So right there, that's a, the, the first thing I want to point out is this. Listen, we just got to, we got to lock down on this, that the, the resurrection is real. It's real. And we, this is where I'm going to be repetitive from last week because we kind of went through a lot of that. It's real. And because it's real, we can defend it. Right? We can, we can apologetically defend it. It's got facts to back it up. It has eyewitness testimony. It's got all of these things. But at the end of the day, all of those arguments are not what matter the most. But for us, we need to understand because we're so far removed from when it happened that it's real. And when we, when we acknowledge that it's real, then we can start to dig into the depths of what that means for us. Here and now. But you got to start somewhere. And so we start with the fact that it's real. And last week we talked too about the centrality of it, right? That it's central to our faith. It's essential. It's an essential doctrine. You, you cannot be a Christian if you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It doesn't, just doesn't fit. Can't do it. Matter of fact, Paul says in this passage we were just reading that if he wasn't raised from the dead, you're still, you're still in your sins, which means you're still dead in your sins. There is no forgiveness of sins outside of the resurrection, outside of the power of Christ. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. That's hard to, that's hard to read. <laughs> Just like that. I feel like it's a tongue twister. But this is, this is part of the implications of what the, what the resurrection means for us. You see, it's central to our faith that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But part, I think where we disconnect is that he was the first fruits. He was the first fruit. If you're a follower of Jesus, there will be a day when you have a resurrection body that's fit to live with him for eternity. I wish I, wish I could explain what that is, because I, I can't. Right? I, I'm awaiting that day. But as I await that day, I don't want to fall into this trap where I don't think about that day. Right? Because this passage tells us that Jesus was the first fruits of that. Just in, 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 he, in this passage, he says that Adam, just as we were all, Adam was a representation or a representative of all of humanity. Right? 
in one man all die. So in one man all will be made alive. Christ has done more than forgive our sins. He has established for us eternity with no pain, no sickness, no death. It says the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Now is that, is that not like good news that there's a day coming where there won't be death? Amen. Now I look around this world and I see that all we see is death. Isn't it? I mean, whether it's wars or terrorism or diseases, I mean, just, it doesn't, I mean it's just everywhere. The world is in decay. And we ask ourselves, well, why is it so messed up? Well, this passage tells us it's sin. By one man, one representative. And then we all willingly jump in and not that we didn't just inherit it, but we jump in and we take part of it. Drag people along with us. And then we look around the world and we wonder why it looks the way it does. Well, it's called sin. It's been in, ever since ever since the fall, this world has been in decline. I love it when people talk about today and all our technology. And, oh, you know, we progressed so much more than the ancients. Do you think we could build a pyramid with no cranes or heavy equipment? We could. We're not any smarter than those people. As a matter of fact, we've regressed. We, we mistake technology for progress. But the two aren't the same. The two aren't the same. And the world doesn't look any better today than it looked back then. As a matter of fact, it may look worse. Right? This is... This is the, the things that we want to... There's a problem we have. We're all going to die. Every one of us. Right? And, and the resurrection sets before us something that says... There's victory coming. There's something out. There's something more. You don't have to fear as a follower of Jesus. You don't have to fear that. Because it's not the end. It's not over. That passage tells us that Jesus defeated death. Conquered sin. Lastly, We're going to finish this passage up, and I just want you to want you to see. I'm hoping that you see something here that I see. I'm not going to go back and read the tongue twister part because it's hard for me to read. Starting in verse 29, it says, "Otherwise, what do people mean by baptized by being baptized on behalf of the dead?" Okay, we should probably stop right there. That's one of them weird little sections of scripture. Like, what were they doing? So apparently the Corinthians were performing baptisms for people that had already died. Right? That's, that seems to be what's happening here. And it's interesting to me that Paul, although he certainly doesn't approve of it and we'll see that, he doesn't, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time on it. He spends more time focusing them on the reality of the resurrection, on the implications and then the application of the resurrection. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there. Let's just say it's not a good practice. Right? And just so you know that in, in, in Mormonism, that's a, that's a common thing. So it is something that, that still is happening. And, and, uh, and it's just, I think, a, a misunderstanding of Scripture and why you would do that. And it happens in other forms as well. Right? And... Uh, the days before the Reformation in the Middle Ages, you know, the, the church would sell indulgences to release, re release people from purgatory and different things like that. Same kind of practice, right? It's just, that, that's just a misunderstanding and an abuse of God's word. So we're not going to spend there too much time other than the, if you ask me to do that, I'm going to tell you no. We don't do that here. So he says... So anyway, that's happening. He says, if the dead are not raised at all, why are people doing it? Why are people baptized on, on their behalf? 
So he, he points out that even a, a bad practice like that is foolishness if the resurrection isn't true. Why are you doing that? Right? So he just pointed out to him, that's, that's silly. You guys, you're not even, you don't even believe the resurrection, but yet you're baptizing people on behalf, you know, that have already passed away. Then he goes on. This is a part I want us to focus in this, these last few verses. says, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So here's what I, here's what I want us to get. This is this is the application that this is. I told you I I had a hard time all week coming up with some fresh. You know I'm like oh Lord speak to me and. and and I don't think it was supposed to be anything new. I think it was just something I was missing. Paul says here, if the resurrection is true, well, first of all, let's say if it's not true. If it's not true, let's just eat, drink, and have a good time because tomorrow we're going to die. Seriously, if it's not true, we might as well just meet on Sundays and throw parties, right? But if it is true, Paul says, what do I gain if humanly speaking I fought with beasts at Ephesus if the dead are not raised? What is he trying to say? I think what he's trying to say is the resurrection enables followers of Jesus to live radically risk-taking, crazy lives. That's what he's saying. Because the resurrection is true. If it's not true, then don't waste your time doing it. Don't go out there and kill yourself for the gospel because the resurrection is not true. But if it is, Christ has freed us to live these incredibly radical lives sold out for him. Totally sold out. Imagine that. Who wants to go fight a lion? But Paul, Paul did it. These things happened to him. Now what makes a guy do that because the resurrection isn't true? No, people don't do that if the resurrection isn't true. They don't willingly give their lives. They don't live in, in total selflessness towards those around them because if the resurrection isn't true, Tomorrow we die. It doesn't matter. Right? So I would. Here's the challenge for the week. Right? This week, see if God doesn't put something before you that, that requires radical risk taking faith. And when you start to pull back from it, Say to yourself, resurrection is true. I don't have to fear. I don't have to be scared. What can they do but take my life? You do understand this is this is crazy talk. Right? This is crazy talk. This is not uh, when I was going to school and stuff. This is not how they told you to prepare sermons. No, 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 no. I mean, read that passage, read it, but then get past it pretty quick and tell everybody everything's going to be okay. I can't. I think the, more, the more time we spend in this book, the more I am convinced that what God has called us to is not what we see or what we're doing. He's called his people to be radical risk-taking. Nuts. Yes. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So seek it. Hey, look for opportunity this week. Look for opportunities to be crazy. Because you 
don't have to fear. And then if you get, if you, if you can't, even if you tell yourself the resurrection, pick up your phone and call somebody in this room. And say, man, I see God wants me to do this today. And then when somebody calls you this week, you tell them the resurrection is true. You got <laughs> nothing to fear. Do it. Just do it. I'll share a quick story as I work and this new crew that I'm on, they're not, they're not, you know, I've told you guys some stories about my last crew, right? And it was just this target rich environment. It's just God giving you opportunity after opportunity to share the gospel. And, and, uh, and I was just so thankful. I switched shifts. And these guys are not, they're, they're a little bit well, better than them. But they don't want to talk about it. I want to share with anything. He does it. And again, so I'm like trying to find opportunities. And then I just started to just like, oh, whatever. Just go in and do my job and go home. Man. Thank God I was having a terrible week. And God puts this driver in front of me at the end of the night. And he asked, he just simply asked me, what else do you do? Right? <laughs> and I, this is where I was, right? I'm, I'm in this place where I'm like, whatever. I just stuff. Uh, <laughs> I got three kids, man. I, you know, I, I just wasn't in that. I wasn't in my normal kind of like ready to go. But he wouldn't let it go. He followed me into the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. You know? And finally, I'm like, okay, Lord, so you want me to talk to this guy? Well, it turns out he's a believer. But he's been estranged from the church, has some really bad experiences. I'm praying that he shows up here. Right? I'm praying that he comes here because I, I, I end up, I'm waiting for the boss to say something to me because we end up talking for about 30 minutes in the break. That's a long bathroom break. <laughs> but I did, I, what was I going to do? What was I going to do? Fire me? Resurrection is real. Resurrection is real. <laughs> what do I have? So, just a funny story, but you know what I'm saying? Sometimes God's not, he's not going to call us to, he's not necessarily going to ask us to go give our lives to, in, in, a, in an arena to a lion. But he might ask us to take a chance and speak the gospel into somebody's life. Right? As a matter of fact, I can almost guarantee it. It's what he's called us to do. And we don't have to be afraid. We don't need to be worried about rejection. And we don't need to be worried about injury. We don't need to be worried about the things that we worry about. Because the victory has been won. Jesus has already secured it. And we can trust him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your people. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that you swallowed up death, sin, and Satan. And Lord, that we don't have to live in fear. That we can believe you because you've already conquered these things. And we just await the day when it all comes together. So Lord, help us to live radically. Help us to take risks. And we don't mean foolishness, but you know, help us follow you, Lord, to see opportunities and to not be scared to be who you called us to be. Help us to speak the gospel into people's lives, Lord, that we might enjoy the fruits of your victory. That we might see people's lives changed and transformed and living for you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. For your glory, Lord, for your glory. Amen. 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 Amen.